Hello, I'm Robert Costa, and this is the Washington Week podcast. Our guests are Andrea Mitchell, Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent for NBC News, Philip Rucker, White House Bureau Chief for The Washington Post, Abby Phillip, White House Correspondent for CNN, and Carl Hulse, Chief Washington Correspondent for The New York Times. President Trump has been engaging in a trade war with China over the last few months in response to what he says are unfair practices. The administration has imposed some tariffs, but then, after last weekend's G20 meeting, he announced a preliminary deal with Chinese President Xi Jinping that would delay the next round of tariffs. Shortly after that, President Trump threatened Beijing in a tweet, calling himself Tariff Man. The markets have not reacted positively to this ongoing dispute. You were with President Trump on his trip, Phil. What's he doing with trade? At one time, easing the relationship with China, but still being defiant in his public rhetoric? He can't seem to decide what he wants. And the problems began uh, at that Saturday night dinner in Buenos Aires. There was a two-hour steak dinner between President Trump and President Xi. After the dinner on the way back on Air Force One, the White House sent out a statement claiming something of a victory, a deal, uh, to put a freeze on this trade war for 90 days. The Chinese disagreed. It seems like the substance just wasn't there. And as soon as we started to see these differing accounts, the markets just tanked. Uh, there was a huge drop in confidence from investors here and around the world about whether this deal could be reached. We saw the tariff man tweet from President Trump, uh, which just scattered things even more. And then just in the last couple of days, we learned uh, that a major Chinese executive uh, from a telecom giant there was arrested uh, in Vancouver, Canada at the request of U.S. authorities, and that has uh, alienated the Chinese even further. And the arrest was done while they were at that dinner. Yeah. And so the Chinese think that this was a deliberate affront. John Bolton was questioned about it and said, well, I didn't tell him. So Bolton does not tell the president that while he's having dinner... What does your reporting tell you about this, Andrea? Did, well, what was President Trump just not informed by his own national security it's, advisor? It's possible. It's, it really is possible because it, it was... The, the allegation is that this company had violated sanctions against Iran, and that is, you know, the holy grail for Bolton and for the president as well, but for Bolton and others in the NSC, they're trying to prove how tough they are against Iran, and they're not thinking in globally about the fact that this was a huge insult to President Xi. And it's not a coincidence that though, that it happened at the same time. There's no way that something like that would go through without thinking about all the implications, including ongoing trade negotiations. Uh, uh, you know, sources told CNN this week that the White... There were some people in the White House who thought this might be good leverage in the trade fight with China, which is an extraordinary thing to say. And it's also something that I think continues to spook markets who are worried that basically the White House and the people around the president basically don't have uh, a sense of the big picture here, that they don't have what it takes to work this out, and that they're playing a game of brinksmanship when they're not prepared to really go up against China, which, frankly, while they are taking a bigger hit than the United States, they are willing to do that more so than the United States is, at least in the short term. Uh, the U.S. is very concerned, and President Trump's very concerned about the economy in the next year, and China is willing to, to really take a big blow if it means winning this trade war in the long term. Are they rattled inside of the White House? Abby, about the, the markets going up and down, up and down. They are. They really are. President Trump is rattled. His aides are concerned about it. They think they're on the right path, but the problem is, uh, I think, a lack of discipline coming out of that meeting and a lack of preparedness, making sure that the, everybody's on the same page going forward. That Those are long-term problems in this administration, and this is just one symptom of that problem. They're hoping to iron things out, straighten out the market. That's why you saw President Trump repeatedly trying to clear clean up this week, but I think ultimately failing. Can I just say that Tariff Man is not a very exciting superhero? No? You know, the, I can't You don't see collect it. Tariff Man yeah, comments, Carl? It's just Tariff Man. What about, uh, what, what, on trade, Carl, C Capitol Hill has a role to play here with the, well, the, the new, new version of NAFTA. Yeah, no, and I think, actually, it, uh, I think that that's going to be a, a first real big test uh, of how they're going to be able to deal with uh, the Democrats in the House. Nancy Pelosi knows her trade stuff. I'm presuming Nancy Pelosi is going to be uh, the speaker. And, you know, when the president recently said, well, I'll just cancel the existing NAFTA and they'll have to take it, the Democrats laughed at that. 
it's like, go ahead and cancel it. You know, we're, we're not that crazy about NAFTA. That's that Republican and the Chamber of Commerce. They like NAFTA. And so I think that uh, reaching a deal here is not going to be that easy. And the Democrats are going to extract some things for this. I do think that go to the markets that Trump has painted himself into a corner. He treats the Dow like a pole. And he's up with the Dow, and he's down. This is how he watches this. It's now uh, the market's given back all the gains from 2018. Check your 401k, and you'll uh, find out that that's the case. And I think if you know if it keeps going up and down like this, it's just going to be difficult for them. Remember, he's spent all that time talking about the markets and how great it's doing, and shows that the uh, administration is doing such a great job now. They have to try and talk up the market, and it's not working. Andrew? He, he could well become the first president since Jimmy Carter to go into a re-election year in a real recession. And that is what markets are now saying. Yeah, and I think one of the things I've been hearing is the concern that basically the recession becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, that the more that the markets worry about it, the more likely it is to become a reality. And that could be just because of the, cult, the climate of uncertainty that the White House is, is exacerbating. They are not helping uh, investors feel secure about the future. Uh, and the result could be that come next summer, uh, the, the economy starts to contract out of fear that a recession is on the horizon. Now, Carl, why didn't the Senate Republicans pass the USMCA, the new version of NAFTA, in the lame duck session? Why don't they? Right. I don't think that, that well, it takes 60 votes, right? So I, I don't think you could get it done. People, I'm not even sure that the, there's that much of the agreement even circulating. No one has talked about that. Uh, I, I don't see that happening. They're, they're barely doing anything as it is. That would be a big, big thing to take on. Phil, any uh, parting thoughts on foreign policy? Because one thing I wanted to ask you about is Jamal Khashoggi. The CIA came to Capitol Hill, yeah. briefed senators about the killing of a Washington Post writer and contributor, and they concluded, the senators who walked out of that meeting, they said Khashoggi was killed in coordination in some way with the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. And that's, again in contrast to what President Trump and his allies are saying. Yeah, the takeaway from the CIA's intelligence for President Trump was maybe he did, maybe he didn't. <laughs> and the takeaway for Senator Lindsey Graham uh, was there was not a smoking gun, but a smoking saw, a reference to the uh, the bone saw that was used at the, at the consulate in Turkey. Uh, Senator Bob Corker, chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, said he would be convicted within uh, 30 minutes, 30 I minutes. believe. They right? changed it to 20. After they changed that it to 20 after. And, you know, President Trump at that G20 summit in Buenos Aires exchanged pleasantries with uh, the crown prince, who was persona non grata among a lot of the foreign leaders there. But President Trump said hello to him. Uh, President Putin, as we saw, had that high five moment, really friendly moment. Um, but it's, it, there's a huge gulf here between Republicans in the Senate and, and the president and how they believe the intelligence. And this hurt Pompeo and Mattis, who the week before yeah. had tried to say, oh, there was no evidence and the CIA did not find a smoking gun, which is Mattis said. The fact is that the CIA doesn't do assessments that way. They don't say, here's the evidence, the proof. They say, the preponderance of, of confidence in this assessment is that it happened. And now we know, uh, thanks to a lot of reporting, that there were 11 intercepted messages between the Crown Prince and the hit team, uh, Katani, his top man, uh, before and after the killing. So it, the implication is very strong. And President Trump is isolated in the world stage. The one takeaway about this I find intriguing politically, Republicans willing to speak up against President Trump's position, just as we head into divided government, just as Robert Mueller kicks into gear. Does it tell us about where the GOP is? Or could they maybe break with President Trump in the future in a, in a more willing way? On certain issues, but, but I think it feels almost like this issue is in its own lane, separate from some of the other things. Uh, Lindsey Graham is more aligned with President Trump today than he was six months ago and six months before that. I don't think that this issue with Saudi Arabia really changes that broader trend. And then several others who you're hearing speak up are not necessarily going to be here. Well, in, in, in I think Bob there's a good point to make about that. Mm -hmm. Jim Risch is going to be the new chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He is very closely allied with the president. He is not anywhere near like Bob Corker yeah. in challenging the White House. In fact, has voted against the resolution uh, 
on the Yemen uh, support for Saudi Arabia. I think that committee is going to be very different, honestly. I don't think they'll vote against... They will not vote, I don't think, to cut off the war in Yemen, but there now is a move towards a resolution, you would know this better than I, Carl, which will actually sanction the crown prince, and that is... Well, and they're trying to find a balance on the sanctions. They, even Mitch McConnell says, we want to uh, react to this and do something. We're not like President Trump, but how, what's, the, what's the sweet spot between total uh, elimination of relations with Saudi and doing nothing. Maybe it's so that's what they're really searching for. F final thought, Abby? I, I just don't think you can t take too much from this particular incident. Republicans appear to be willing to push back on the president on this, uh, but I think that we will find that the next Congress is going to be much more beholden to President Trump than this current one is, both in the Senate and in the House. Uh, the president has a stronghold on his party, and I don't think that that is going to change. That's it for this edition of the Washington Week podcast. You can listen wherever you get your podcast or watch online on our Washington Week website. And while you're there, check out the Washington Weekly News Quiz. I'm Robert Costa. See you next time.